Today we're going to cover a topic that is uh, going to be very much uh, a kind of an extension to what you learned in 408. And um, uh, this is a topic on joint uh, tiling technique uh, using ultra high performance test linear algebra libraries. Uh, for those of you who, you know, who have seen a DBS library for machine learning, especially for deep learning, uh, the foundation for training neural net or inference uh, in neural net is to convert the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, convolution layers into uh, matrix multiplication. And then uh, there is a whole slew of uh, techniques that they use to produce these very high performance uh, the, the matrix multiplication implementations. And then, so what you're learning for all eight is quite good but it's definitely not good enough. If you try to use something like that uh, for those libraries, it's, it's, it's not going to be, uh, it's going to get you about 60%, more than 60% of what the, the real libraries uh, can get you. So uh, this lecture is about uh, some of these ultra engineering uh, you know, the techniques that uh, people use in order to produce these very high performance libraries. And in order to write code like this, you need to be able to understand some of the intricacies of the hardware and then combine that with the, uh, the parallelism and with the uh, how it works. So, um, you know, we're going to, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to learn how to place data into the registers to enhance the available data access bandwidth to the compute units. Okay. And um, uh, in fact, uh, you know, there, uh, this is also about some of the trade-offs in terms of reducing the number of data that you uh, you load, uh, you, know, you have to keep in the on-chip memory. So you know, in many ways, if you, when you look at uh, these kind of code, unless someone take the time to explain these things you know, to you on a step-by-step -step basis, it can take a long, long time to understand the code. Okay, so so this is sort of the you know the, where we start to draw the line between undergraduate students and graduate students. Okay. Uh, but grad students need to be able to understand you know, things like this. And uh, uh, so basically the, uh, the, the, base, uh, the idea is that uh, when we do tiling, we have some on-chip resources. Okay. Um, uh, shared memory is a great on-chip resource. And on the other hand, we also have a fairly large number of registers in these GPUs. So, uh, you know, when we compare these two different hardware resources, the hardware on-chip memory resources, registers are accessed at extremely high throughput, and also they don't require additional instructions. Remember, you know, last time we, we, we went over this last time, right? You, um, they, you, you don't need to have an extra memory load instruction to move from the shared memory into registers before you can you know, use that data. If you keep the data in the registers, it's just, uh, you know, it can be accessed by all the instructions right away. And then, with, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, these registers are private to each thread. So if you try, try to reuse the register contents across different tasks, you have to fold those tasks into the same thread, right? So that uh, the thread would need to perform multiple tasks and reuse that data. Right. That was the main message that we had uh, from last time. Right. So we saw how you can maintain that register queue right, mm -hmm. and fold the calculation of the uh, grid points along the z direction all into one thread. Right. And then you can, you can keep reusing that, uh, the register. You get three times reduction in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the memory bandwidth required along the z direction. Right. So that was, you know, that, that's registers. Shear memory. Uh, you know, uh, ac uh, is accessed at a lower throughput than registers, but you know, still much higher bandwidth than the global memory. If you put data into a shared memory, you get at least an order magnitude uh, of you know, magnification in your uh, access bandwidth. But keep in mind, you still need to access that data as a memory data. You still need to use a load instruction. Just that load instruction is much shorter latency, and also it has much higher bandwidth than if you have to you know, go to the L2 cache, or in the worst case, to the D. 
So, uh, there's, but the data is visible to all the threads in a block, and you do not need to, uh, you know, to, uh, to need, uh, need to uh, need the thread coarsening in order to use it. And there's something also very, very subtle. If you need to load multiple data points okay, uh, into shear registers, uh, you can actually have threads to collaborate, right? You can have multiple threads to collaborate and, and load those multiple data points. But if you're going to load data points into registers, only that, that thread can do the loading. So however number of threads that uh, data points you need to load, you need to you know, take the steps and sequentially load those data elements by, with that thread, right? So there is a little bit of trade-off in terms of how quickly you can get data into the shared memory versus you know, the, the, how quickly you can get data into registers. So, um, but it still needs to be you know, first loaded into registers that I mentioned several times. So we typically use both for counting different dimensions of a higher dimensional uh, data structure. So oftentimes we will take one of the dimensions and say we're going to pile this dimension in the registers. And we're going to pile that other dimension in shear memory so that we can actually combine the, you know, the capacity, okay, the capacity of registers and shared memory to get more data you know, into the uh, into non-shared memory rather than just putting all the pressure on shared memory, for example, right? And then because the registers are, and shared memory are accessed through different hardware paths mm -hmm. and registers don't need to be you know, first loaded into registers so you can actually have even higher bandwidth when you use data from both sources. Okay, from both sources. So this is what the, you know, the we're going to see today with a, an uh, engineering, as a kind of an uh, engineering design of how uh, you know, this high performance uh, tiling code works. So um, this particular work is actually first done by uh, Valkov and uh, uh, Denver at uh, Berkeley. And um, so, you know, when they first uh, did their uh, work, it was you know it, it, it really was like magic to many people. But um, you know, so essentially, they have been doing this kind of work for years, and then they apply some of the work that they, they previously did in the CPU world. So these kind of things don't necessarily only belong in the GPU. Okay? And you know, there are also uh, only a few known techniques that people use again and again across different hardware types. So that's why this kind of course makes sense because you know, the, the kind of uh, these are the techniques that you will likely be able to reuse in different hardware types you know, through your career. And it's worth learning once. So here is the kind of the, uh, a very quick um, review of how the matrix multiplication data reuse works. So basically, we, we show the M matrix here with the, the row you know, the, the access, and then the <coughs> M matrix here for the column access. One row and one column with a, a top product gives us one of the P elements, right? And then another row, the same column gives you the, 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 uh, the next lower P element, and so on. So in order to generate these four P elements, we're going to access four rows of N, but only one column of N. So this column data is being reused, right? And so this is you know, very, very basic, and we've already talked about in 408, but it's very important when we begin to walk, work into the, uh, the joint tiling, so I want to make sure that it's fresh you know, in your mind when we uh, you know, look at it. So the second one is, you know, if you look at a row of P, the elements in, the, uh, in this row are all generated from the same M row, right? But different columns of N. So, you know, the row elements will be reused in generating all the P elements in the same row, right? So these are, you know, two data re, uh, uh, reuse uh, patterns that we're going to be using for, uh, you know, for the tiling. So, let's do, do a very, very simple example here. Um, if we have a 4x4 four four output tile, okay, obviously it's small, right? For 408, you were using 32x32 32 32 output tile, or smallest is 16x16, 16 16, right? So, 
uh, you know, uh, we, when we do the 4x4 four four tile, and using the shear memory tiling that we taught in 408, uh, you know, strictly speaking, um, you know, we, what we did was we loaded this 4x4 four four tile, input tile, and 4x4 four four output tile for, from M and N into the shear memory, and then we do four steps, okay, four steps of the inner product for every element, right? So we, we load this tile here into, in, uh, and this uh, other tile here, and then so basically we have four elements from the M, from each row of M, and these four elements give us and uh, uh, give us the four steps, four inner product steps that we need to generate each of these elements, right? So that's why, you know, you have this loop that uh, goes through the segments. And then uh, in each segment, we load the tile and then tile of n, and then we take multiple steps in that innermost loop, and then, you know, we take the next iteration, eventually we're done, right? So, you know, it, it is a kind of a, a you know, good approach, but if you think about it carefully, you will realize that uh, you know, we really don't have to, to load a 4x4 four four input tile. Because if we load just four elements of N, you know, that all the, uh, just load a little vertical strip of N, and the horizontal, small horizontal uh, 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 strip of N, we will be able to do one step of the inner product mm -hmm. for all the 16 elements, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we, if we really are short of memory, unchip memory space, we could have just loaded a small strip of M, a strip of N, do one step, and then, you know, load the next one, the, the next strip, and the next strip, and do, you know, do the same thing. It turns out, <coughs> each, this actually does not reuse the data reuse, okay? You can actually you know, achieve the same level of data reuse if you just load you know, each strip of N and each strip of N, and you reuse each data four times, right? Because you're going to be you know, calculating using this element four times with these elements, right? So this gives you exactly the same data reuse. So the question is, you know, why did we, you know, teach you how you just load a tile of n and n, you know, the four by four tile in this case? Another, you know, observation is that, you know, the output tile doesn't even have to be square. It can easily be a rectangular tile. So we could have, you know, a um, something like a 4 by 2 kind of you know, rectangular tile, as long as we load four elements of N and two elements of N each time, right? So in this case, if you're calculating a 4 by 2 tile using the original 408 algorithm, what we could do is we could actually just, you know, bring in a, you know, a rectangular tile of N and then, you know, a rectangular tile of N. As long as we cover all the elements, we're okay, right? So, so you know, that's another, you know, important, you know, um, step that you need to uh, think about. So, algorithms for high-performance computing oftentimes is an engineering design space. The most critical part is for you to begin to think about your alternatives as a design space and, can, and have the ability to think through, okay, the trade-offs, okay, the trade-offs when you maneuver from one part of the engineering space to another engineering space. So this is why high-performance programming is a little bit different than Java programming and some of these, you know, the enterprise kind of programming, you know, API kind of programming. The high-performance programming is a lot closer to designing a hardware system. You have a design space and then you have these different trade-offs that you have to you know, think through. So for this, you know, for this rectangular case, we can you know, do exactly the same as what we you know, talked about before. You know, we, we use that first strip and you know, first strip of uh, four elements of n and first strip of four, four, uh, two elements of n. We do a single step, and then we move to the next strip of n and next strip of n. Right. So this step two, 
and then do the second step of all the inner product, right, uh, of the uh, four, uh, of the eight P elements. So, uh, you know, if we do it this way, we only need to have four elements of, you know, the four, four, four elements of uh, M and two elements of N in the unchanged memory at any time. So we only need to have six elements, right, in order for all the eight threads to make progress. So for eight, if we do four by four, we need to have four and four, so that's eight elements at the same time. So if we look at the kernel code, basically, you know, the kernel that you wrote here, um, you know, each thread will load uh, one element of n and one element of n in the in the in the outer loop. So this is the collaborative loading pattern for the thread for each thread to load one element of n and one element of n into the shear memory, mm -hmm. right? And then so you have for a 32 by 32 th uh, you know, uh, tile, you will use 1,024 threads. And you will load 1,024 elements of n and 1,024 elements of n into the shear memory, and then you take, you know, 32 steps, right? And in every you generate 32 steps of the inner product for every output element in that type, in the output element type. So then you're done. However, you could also, you know, e easily change this code into a rectangular tile code where you, instead of having a tile width, you should have tile width n and tile width n, right? And then you can you know, just adjust the, the loop bounds and so on that uh, you can you know, actually process rectangular tiles as well. So that's all good, okay, that's all good in 408, right? Any questions about the 408 code? Okay, good. So, you know, we, Conceptually, let's make sure that we, you know, we were very clear about you know, the, you know, what the previous uh, uh, code is about. For a rectangular tile of tau with, you know, uh, on each side, you have tau with square elements of n and tau square element of n into the unchained memory, and each thread will calculate tau with steps for tau with square elements of p, right? And the tile width is typically at least 16 to give you enough, you know, uh, uh, work in the uh, in the thread block. And according to our analysis, we can use you know much smaller amount of shared memory. Right? We already talked about you know we can just do a single strip, or you can even do two strips. Right? You can do three strips. Why do you have to do all the 32 strips? Right? In the 32 by 32 tile. So uh, loading the tau width element of n and the uh, tau width uh, element of n to calculate one step would give you, you know, the same result. So you know, why didn't we do that? The reason is cost, cost of loading and also loading balance. Okay. So um, you know, if each iteration in the outer loop, you know, in, in the outer loop, if we're only doing a you know, a strip of n and strip of n, then, you know, let's say using the 32 by 32 output tile, we only have 32 threads active in loading the n elements, right? And only 32 threads active in loading the n elements. The other threads are turned off. So we have divergence, we have, you know, loading balance, right? Uh, so the, those are the, you know, the, the kind of things that would kind of chip away your performance. And then, you know, remember, each time we finish these, you know, uh, you know, the outer loop steps, we need to do sync thread to make sure that all the threads are uh, in sync before you. We can go and override the elements in the uh, shared memory, right? So before the next batch of shared memory elements, you know, the tile, uh, input tile elements can come in. You need to make sure that all the previous input tile elements have been consumed by all the threads. So we have these two sync threads. Right? One is to make sure that all the elements have indeed been loaded before the threads all come to, to, to take the steps. And the second one is to make sure that all the threads have finished the steps before the next tile el elements can come in. Right? So those two sync threads are going to, still going to be there. So if we only take one step 
in the innermost loop, we don't really have much work before synchronization points. Okay? And even though these sync threads are extremely efficient functions compared to the CPUs, if you do a, a, a barrier synchronization on a CPU, we're talking about minimal of thousands of clock cycles okay, to do a, to, to do, uh, to do a, uh, you know, a, a barrier synchronization. In a GPU, these things are you know, small number of cycles. However, the small number of cycles still, small number of cycles. If you only do a small amount of work with some small number of cycles, and then you're, you're, you're taking small amount of cycles to the synchronization, it can still hurt you. Okay? So that's why we usually try to do more amount of work before synchronization points. So, so let's keep this in mind as we walk through the joint piling. Okay, these are the design constraints that we need to be able to deal, you know, to, to actually still succeed, uh, you know, uh, in uh, you know, satisfying when we, uh, you know, use the joint volume technique. So, in this technique, we store the input tile and the output p tile elements in registers. In the 408 code, we already store the p elements in registers. Okay? However, we're only storing one p element in each thread register. Right? Every thread has a p element in this register. Okay? And, um, so, in the joint tiling, we will uh, store, we'll continue to store the output p tile elements in registers, but we are also going to store the input n tile. It, the, the choice between m and n is somewhat arbitrary. Okay, so you know, I'm going to just pick n, and then if you're interested, you can actually do the you know the n case, and you know, just to you know for fun, right? So um, we're going to uh, store the input uh, the n tile elements in the shear memory. Okay, so one input in the, in the registers and one input in the shared memory for increased capacity usage. Right? Now, and we decouple the M and N input you know, tile width. So we're going to you know, independently determine how many M elements we're going to be keeping in the, right, in the registers and how many N elements we're going to be keeping in the shared memory. Okay, so we have a you know tile with M and tile with N. So in this particular example, tile with M is four and tile with N is two, right? For that simple example here. So uh, there are a few important quantities uh, that you need to you, know, uh, you, you need to be you know you need to be able to immediately answer to your, for yourself. We're going to use tile with n threads. Okay, we're going to use this many threads. The number of threads will be the same as tile uh, with n. And it will become very clear. It has to do with which data structures being kept in the registers. Okay, the number of, uh, uh, you know, the, L, the data structure in the registers dictate, the tile size of data structure dictates the number of threads. Okay. The output tile size you know, is tau with n times tau with of n, right? So that's given. And reuse for each n element, the number of reuses for each n element is the tau with of n. The number of times you, you reuse each n element is the tau with of n, right? Because the, all these ones are going to be reusing the same n elements, right, in, in doing their steps. And then the reuse for the n element is the tau with of n, right? And so each thread calculates tau with n p elements. That is, we're going to do thread coarsening, okay? So that the, each thread will be calculating multiple p elements, right? And the multiple p elements, the number of p elements is, the, is determined by tau with of n. So the reason is, remember, we are keeping this thing in the register, okay, in the register. So the only way that we can reuse that element 
across multiple tasks is by what? Thread coarsening the work into the same thread. So each thread is now going to be calculating multiple p elements. The number of all these elements in the same horizontal direction will be calculated by the same thread. That's why the number of reuse for n element is tau with n. Okay, the tau with n here. Because this, the size here is dictated by tau with n. So if you didn't see this figure and you just listened to what I just said, it will be just essentially alphabet soup, okay? You will be tau with wood, tau with wood, tau with wood, tau with wood, right? But as soon as you begin to, you know, to really understand the design, what I said will make perfect sense to you. So go home, explain this to your roommate tonight, okay? And make sure that, you know, you can do it perfectly. And then, you know, that means that you really understand the design, right? The design is very simple. We're going to keep n elements in registers, n elements in shared memory, and you know we're going to uh, we're going to use you know multi uh, threads according to the n width, and because each thread is going to walk through all the n elements and generate a collection of p elements in this direction, right? So so then you can easily derive all these you know, all these you know, uh, what I call the kind of the basic quantities. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to confuse. Uh, so, uh, saying that we keep those uh, M tile, uh, no, the M into the thread. Reg registers. Yes, so that means that we have four threads with uh, each one has one M element in that thread. So, um, you know, so when you, you know, the question is, you know, the, we're keeping these things in registers, uh -huh. right? So uh, are you uh, asking what uh, what kind of progress can you make with this element? Uh, no, I'm saying that uh, so for this example, we are saying, uh, for example, we have four threads. Each one keeps one M element inside its register. Yeah. And uh, that will use the two uh, N elements in shared memory to complete two key elements. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So that's why we're folding the, the the two steps in these, uh, for these p elements into a single thread. So that single thread is going to be doing this and then this. Yeah. One step. Okay. Good. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So these will be uh, non coalesced right? Yes. So, so that's why in the end, I'll, I'll talk about that. You need to transpose. For this one, this is actually different, a good, important difference between this code and the 4OA code. The 4OA code, you don't need to transpose n. Because we, we do the corner turning when we load the, the input tile. But here, there's no way you can do turn, corner turning, so you actually need to do the transpose. Okay. <laughs> so, optimization one, thread coarsening. Okay, so now I'm taking you through the uh, kind of the Yes. So <coughs> we have each thread to calculate a horizontal strip of p elements, okay, p elements, and um, uh, you know, uh, and the number of elements here is dictated by the width, the tau width of n, right, tau width n. So that's why these pictures are handy. So the data loaded from n can be reused tau width n times through the you know, uh, through registers. So this is the classical register tally, right? Uh, you reuse your registered data multiple times. Okay. And so here, essentially what we do is we load, let's say, this element into R1 of, a, uh, of you know, the thread. And then uh, R1 will be used to calculate you know, the shear memory elements, let's say, N1, N2, N3, N4. And then, uh, so we do one step of you know, the PL. Okay. Nothing new here. I'm just you know, summarizing what that, that first one. So it's register piling as this first step. And the second one is uh, shear memory piling. So we have multiple threads to collect, collaboratively load this strip, right? To load this strip into the, you know, uh, uh, into the shear memory. So 
you know, uh, we only, in this case, we only need to load uh, four elements. So if we have four threads here, then it's perfect, right? Four threads here, and then four threads loading one element each, then we're done. So low balance, no divergence, okay, right? That's okay so far. So in one iteration, each thread will access one M element. So each thread will take one, the element is, in its register. And then, uh, you know, the access pile with N elements. So you will go to the shared memory and access all these elements. So every thread will access all these elements. And then generate one step for the, the P element, right? So, uh, so the tile width, in this case, you know, N will be probably in practice will be about 16 because you need to keep all the P elements in the same thread register, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So the number of registers is still limited. Yes. So in practice, it's very hard to, to use more than 16 registers okay, in each thread. And it will add up very, very quickly. So in fact, on average, you know, you should you know, you, you can probably use somewhere between 10 and 20 registers <coughs> in a high performance, you know, to the code. So each thread use, well, maybe about 16 registers in practice. So, so, you know, that's why you have a limited number of elements that you can have in this direction. Okay, so this tile width is usually about 16 or so. It could be 8, it could be a little bit more than that, but not, not, very different from 16. When it comes to the design of the tile width of M, remember M dictates, right? The tile width of M dictates the number of threads in the thread block. That number needs to be reasonably big. If you only have 32, you only have one word. You don't even have some scheduling, you know, the, the opportunity. So typically, you want to have 64 or more. So now you begin to see the picture. The picture is that we're going to have probably a lot longer a strip here than the width here. We're going to be having 64 or more here, but 16 or less here. Now we start to see some ugly pictures. Because if you have, let's say, 64 or more here, 64 threads, when it comes to loading these elements, only a small subset of them will be needed, right? So we, now we start to have, you know, divergence, and we start to have, you know, loading balance, right? But why not just load like multiple scripts? I mean, you need it sometimes. So. Absolutely. So this is exactly, remember I keep mumbling about this. You know, you can, you, you can load one strip, right, for each one and make one step. You can load two strips for each one to make two steps, right? I said that, you know, a few times that sounded boring, right? That's exactly what I, you know, I'm just hoping to hear this comment right here, right? Because I could have everyone to, you know, to participate and load, let's say, 64 of these, four of the strips. Right? Four of the strips here. But in order for that to make sense, each thread will now need to use, uh, load also four elements here to be able to do the four steps. So you will need to, each thread will now need to have four of those elements as well. Right? So, so that increases the register pressure a little bit. Not huge, but you know, a little bit. It does increase the sheer memory pressure more. Right? Okay. So, so the loading this involve only a subset of threads, we already talked about that. So, the practical solution is exactly what uh, you know, that we just, uh, we'll just hear here. We take the tau with n and take tau with n, take the ratio, right? In the previous slide, the ratio was 4, right? The tau with 
the tau with n is four times bigger than tau with n, so we define that as k. Okay. For every thread, we will load k m elements into registers because k is the number of steps that we're going to be doing, uh, you know, the taking for every element. The k is the number of inner product steps that we're going to be taking for every output element once we loaded the tiles. So we would load k of these n elements into, into the registers of each thread. And then we would have each thread to need to use tile with n registers for the output elements. This is the increased register pressure we're going to see. Okay? And then the k registers for the, uh, you know, the, the, the m elements. So that gives, a, the, uh, sorry, this is the original register pressure and this is the additional register pressure. And then each thread calculates k steps when you, you know, when take it, right? So, so that's the code. So in summary, this is you know, something that you need to do when you take a uh, quiz in this, you know, uh, for this section. And basically, you know, the, each block has tau with n threads, right? It's dictated by the, the data structure that's being stored in the registers, okay? And then each thread is coarsened by tau with n times so that you can, you know, the, you can do the work for, for the, uh, all the elements of the input n, right? Input n in one thread for the horizontal strip of output. And each thread loads one in an element. Every thread, all the threads will collaborate and load one input n element into the shear memory, right? So in that case, remember the n strip was 16, so we, 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 we do the k mod a factor of 4, so that's 64. So all the 64 threads will have a role in loading the 64 elements, right? And then every thread, so every thread will need uh, load only one n element, but then uh, every thread will load k of the m elements into the registers, right, into their registers, and then once you're done with this sync thread, right, you still need to do the sync thread, and then you can do k steps of the p elements for all the p elements, and then do the sync thread again, and then you do the iteration, okay? So this is the joint Tiling code. If you look at the code, if you go and, and look at the text of the code, it's not that different. Okay, it, it's a little bit different than the previous one. Okay, than the EC four A code, but it's going to behave quite differently in terms of performance and occupancy and so on. And I'm going to show you, you know, some analysis. But before we do that, any any question about this? How how we you know? put data into the registers versus shear memory, and how do you do the thread coarsening, and how do you, you know, increase the number of elements in the shear memory to, you know, to improve load balancing, right, reduce divergence, and then now you have a balanced engineer code for, you know, for this. Okay? Good? Yes? Um, for the um, intermediate result in the P matrix, why do you have to store in the register? Yeah, so um, you know, in general, uh, you don't have to store in the registers. You could, you know, the allocate shared memory for you know, storing those results. But that would, uh, but, but that would increase the, the critical path for accumulating result. Because uh, you know, the, when you try to you know, load from the shared memory and then add and then put back to the shared memory, that consumes the band bandwidth. Right. Okay. So for the toy example, you know, that we, we already went through this, so I'm not going to, you know, so this is just for your own uh, practice. So for G8, uh, G, G, uh, GTX 280, this was a, a supercomputing paper by Botkov and Den, uh, Demo. So each block has 64 threads. So, you know, uh, tau with n is 64. And each thread coarsened by 16 times, so the tau with n is 16. And each thread loads, uh, you know, one n element and four m elements to calculate four steps of the uh, 16 p elements. This is exactly what they did 
for the GTX code. And that set the rec world record for uh, matrix multiplication in that year. Okay. So, you know, you would say, oh, you know, I'm just born a little bit too late. <laughs> <laughs> if I were born a few years earlier, I would have written that paper, and then uh, you know, I would have you know, done, done this. Absolutely right. If you have taken 508, by then, of course, you know, all of you will be able to do it. But back then, it was not a you know, widely understood topic. Okay. So this goes back to you know, the, the first golden rule of graduate school. In order for you to become the most successful grad student PhD that, that we ever produced, you need to be at the right time, at the, at the right place, at the right time in history. And you need to be ready for it. Okay. So when the G GTX 280 you know, hardware came out, you need to have this level of skill to be able to think through it, crack the algorithm, write an SC paper, and get everyone impressed, so that the media library today, even today, still is largely based on this technique. Okay. Yes? Uh, what is the year? Oh, this is 2000 and... Uh, 11, I believe. 10 or 11. Yeah, 2010 or 11. 8. Right? 8. Oh, even better. 2008. Yep. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Because it's 280. Yep. 17 was uh, G80, and then, you know, uh, 8 is 2008. Uh, 280. Okay. So here, let's do a little bit of comparative analysis. And uh, uh, this is essentially the kind of analysis that uh, you know, uh, Bakov and uh, Demo did. And you know, so if you take the thread you know, uh, for the, um, the shared memory tiling code, if you do a 32 by 32, you will need to use 12 kilobytes of on-chip memory you know, uh, for, uh, for this. What is that? 4K for M. 4K for n, this is single precision, you double precision multiplied by 2. And then, don't forget, you still need to have 4K, the output in the registers, right? So, so this is something easy to forget, right? You, you know, even though you know, every thread is only writing into one key element, you know, keeping one in the element, because of the number of threads, you're still using a lot of the, the, you know, the space in the on-chip memory, right? So 12K byte of on-chip memory. And then uh, for the register shared memory tiling uh, tile version of uh, you know, uh, SGN, then each thread block computes 64 by 16 uh, results, right? So you know uh, the number of p elements in the tile is dictated by the tile with n times tile with n, right? Remember that uh, that rectangular tile of output. So we need to keep, you know, still need to keep 1,024 results. So we keep the same number of results, but different shape. Rather than 32 by 32, is 64 by, uh, by 16. Fine. And then, uh, but you know, we only need to use uh, five and uh, quarter k uh, kilobyte on-chip memory. And uh, you know, so the, uh, the reason is we we're not loading the entire input tile as in 408. We're only loading four strips. Right, four strips of the 64, right, and also four strips of an, an, uh, you know, a, a C, uh, four strips of n, right, and then uh, you know uh, four strips of n, right. In order to do the four steps, right, so that reduces the number of bytes, and we only need to have five and quarter bytes of memory. So if you look at the comparison, you know. The number, uh, the number of you know reuse per data for jointly tiled S, uh, uh, S, uh, uh, SGM, the data reuse 16, but then the shared memory is 32. The number of reuse per data in N is 64, and then uh, you know so this is the 32. So we have imbalanced reuse, but when you you know, start to come you know, kind of compare the two, they even out. Okay. And then the number of data computed per block in P, you know, this is a total, the same total number of P elements in the output tile, 
And then the shared memory usage is 256 bytes for the joint tiling and 8K bytes uh, for the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, shared memory only tiling. And then the, uh, the register usage is a lot bigger here and that, you know, the, uh, it's quite a bit bigger here and it's, small, it's uh, a little bit smaller here. But it's only, you know, about 25% difference. And, you know, the, uh, the performance is actually almost 50% more for that particular hardware. And the difference actually grow over time in different generations. Okay, because the bandwidth becomes more and more and more important, you know, when you, uh, when you, uh, when you have faster and faster compute units and more and more and more compute units. Okay? So, now, this goes back to the question. <laughs> so, um, for data layout for C, remember um, the threads, right? The threads were accessing data, you know, horizontally in N, right? So, you know, when you traverse, you know, have multiple threads accessing data in the horizontal direction in C, you're not being coalesced because all the neighboring threads will be accessing none adjacent elements when you do when you do the, the, the vertical strip. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need to do the you know the transpose and you know so that uh, all the threads will be accessing data vertically. Okay. And, and will be accessing data vertically. And then uh, you know so uh, if this would uh, give so that's why if you look at you know um, all these libraries they will give you the transpose uh, input, okay, for exactly this reason. So for the data layout for Fortran is the other way around. Fortran is column major uh, layout. So when the threads access the, uh, you know, in the horizontal direction, they are coalesced because the elements in a column will be laid out in the memory consecutively. So that's why if it's a Fortran code, then a uh, Fortran version of CUDA, uh, 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 CUDA code, then you will need to transpose the N, N so that uh, you can you know, uh, do the uh, property. However, you don't really need to do transpose because you know, if you can do the corner turning, so it depends on what you do. Unfortunately, because we only load four elements, right? We only uh, load four elements, uh, four little strips, corner turning may not work. Right, so that's why, in the end, when you do register uh, shared memory joint tiling, oftentimes for Fortran you still need to do the transposition, even though you're loading into shared memory. You don't have enough of the kind of the wiggling space because you're only loading four strips, okay, or small number of strips. And that's it. Okay. So, uh, so uh, this is going to be one of your, uh, you know, the, uh, one of your projects. So uh, for uh, MPs. So for those of you who did the matrix multiplication uh, implementation of neural net in your your 408 project, mm -hmm. you know, one of the fun things that you can do is to think about how you can, you know, uh, when, when you uh, translate from the convolution to matrix multiplication, remember the high performance implementation is not to do the, trans, uh, the, the uh, convolution to matrix multiplication uh, you know, uh, as a step, but rather you just kind of assemble, right? You assemble the tiles on the fly. But then when you do the register tiling, you would have a slightly different way of assembling your tiles. Right? You, you need to you know, do the register, load the register, and so on. So it, it, it will, it's actually kind of fun to translate, you know, uh, you know some, I think some of the uh, groups already did this. If, if you get a high, uh, uh, you know, if you get rent uh, in the single digit, you probably have already done this. But for those of you who did not do that step, I think it will be a lot of fun just going back and redo your tile assembly with the you know, register and shared memory column that join together. Okay? And then you will see some significant improvement in the performance of your code. And that's quite close to the uh, to the tensor uh, to to the uh, uh, 
the NVIDIA uh, no, TensorRT uh, implementation. Okay. So, um, you know, any other questions about joint planning? We can we can talk about any steps. But the, the front of questions, I think people are you know, we're following, right? So, you know, the, any but any question? If, if not, then I have good news for you. So the, we're going to uh, let everyone go early today. And uh, there are a couple of things that I, I want to make sure that uh, you know, we're on the same page. Um, you know, I, I still, I don't think we quite have the, the right version for uh, submission, for grading submission yet, right? I have not seen the release. No. So we have not seen that, right? So uh, we're going to ex uh, extend the deadline for MP1 until Sunday. But if, uh, if we cannot release them by tonight, we'll give you a little more, more time. Okay, so don't panic. However, it shouldn't take you much, uh, you know, much time because you can just keep testing your code, right? All it, all it is is when you get a new binary, you do a submit of the, exactly the same thing so that you will get into the database. The only difference is that run, the result will get registered into a, 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 a reliable database. Okay, so that's the only difference. Okay. Uh, the second one is when you uh, you, know, I, uh, you should immediately begin to you know, to work on the second MP. Okay. Don't wait until next week to the, to start your MP two. Yes. But the link doesn't work. The link doesn't work. Oh, the link doesn't work. We'll fix it. Okay. <laughs> so good to know. So any other question about the the lab? Um, do you know when the second MP will be due? Yeah, uh, the second MP is supposed to be due uh, next Thursday, but uh, we would uh, we would also extend it a little bit. But eventually, we want to uh, make sure that you know, all of you will kind of you know, will, will slowly you know, get uh, get everyone back uh, in line, because you know but we don't want the uh, the MPs to cut too much into the final project. Okay, so you know we we just kind of you know slowly get everyone back into the, essentially the due date is uh, the Thursday is the Thursday before uh, you know, the Thursday when the next MP is assigned okay and we will try to release as many of the MPs as possible just in case you need to travel I know some of you will need to interview and so on right? so we will give you as much flexibility as we can okay. any other questions about the lab how many of you have finished MP1 as far as testing is concerned? Yeah. The, so you know, make sure that you, you finish that because it, it's kind of a, a, a lot of work. You know, if you just sit down and do it, it shouldn't take more than two, three hours. If it takes more than two, three hours, come and talk to me. <laughs> you know, I need to understand why. Okay. Uh, deadline for quiz. What's that? Deadline for ah, quiz. Ah, ah, deadline for quiz. So the quiz is designed for you to, to really, you know, sort of the, uh, the put the concept together and then, you know, so that you can answer some questions, right? So the quiz actually is meant to be taken after the NP is due. So that, uh, you know, you have the, the NP and so on under your belt and then you can answer the quiz. So the quiz is probably going to be due, uh, the, the first quiz would actually uh, be due, uh, would, would post the due date but uh, it will be about a week after we post it, so it will not be no earlier than um, the next Thursday. So it's already posted. Uh, the first quiz is posted today. Really? Yeah. Well, there's links for the, the, the link is what quiz. There are old quizzes that are on the website. That's the old quiz. Yes. Don't do it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm updating the quiz. Okay. The, by the way, the quiz is not uh, designed to you know as a real exam per se because you can repeat the quiz until you, you're happy. Okay? So it's really meant for you, to, you know, to, to, to figure out why you're making mistakes and you know, how to get the right answers so that you, you don't postpone all your studies until the, the two days before the final exam. Okay? That's really the intention, yes. Um, so if you're updating the quizzes, um, will you just like send an email once they're yeah. ready? Yeah, well done. Okay. Any other questions? If not, using my friend Jin Jun Shun's uh, comment, I'm giving you half an hour back. <laughs> Make use of the time wisely. 
and then uh, you know the finish the MPs, right? And uh, you know the study and so on, so that you'll be happy. Okay. <laughs> so I'll see you next Tuesday.